Twitch.it is proudly brought to you by Computer Troubleshooters to Wimble West, Technology Solved, and Oz Hosting, Cloud Made Easy. Welcome to Switched On IT. This is the show where we talk about everything IT. Uh, today, uh, we are going to continue the discussion on security and, um, and how to protect your data. So uh, we have Ray Sidney Smith from the United States and Doug Industry from Sydney with us again today. Doug and Ray, welcome to the show. Hi there. Thank you, Barry. Good to be here. Good. Now, uh, I'm just going to turn this over to you. Uh, talk to us about uh, security, please. Sure. Thanks, Thanks, Barry. Um, Ray, last week we were talking about um, the security of, of networks and, and, and the dangers involved and some hints and tips to make sure that, that um, uh, you made the best use of the, of the networks you were on. Um, particularly, we were talking about Wi-Fi and some of the vulnerabilities there. So, so this week, we're talking about, uh, about endpoint protection. And, and you used a terrific analogy last week, which was to, to talk about you know, the, uh, the castle we're in and we've got a moat and we've got a drawbridge and we can you know, lower the drawbridge and, and let traffic through or, or not, as the case may be. Um, but that's all about you know, at, the, at the perimeter, I guess, um, managing the network and how the network behaves. And so today we're, we're talking about the actual um, endpoint devices themselves. And I thought maybe we can put that into a couple of different ca categories because we've got our, our computers. People might use a, a, a Windows PC or a, or a Mac, a MacBook Pro or an iMac or something like that. Um, and we can look at the, the security challenges that we all face in, in keep, keeping those devices secure. And then we've got our mobile devices and our tablets and, and the, the popular variants there are going to be obviously the, um, the iPhone, the Apple iPhone using the iOS operating system, um, the, the uh, Android operating system used on Samsung Galaxies and so many other um, uh, mobile devices out there and tablets. And then of course you've got Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows operating system for, for you know, phones and tablets as well. So. I thought we'd, you know, maybe step through it um, in in that way. So, you know, maybe we could start with um, the the Apple iOS operating system on our MacBook Pros and our and our iMacs. What makes that different from a security standpoint versus a, a Windows operating system? Sure, I think it I think it ends up being a bit of a uh, misunderstanding about whether or not you're more or less vulnerable because you're on a Unix-based operating system that that supposedly less people are trying to attack. Uh, the reality is is that anyone who wants to hack you specifically, you know, if somebody goes after you, Doug Endersby, uh, it's very uh, unlikely you'll be able to stop them from being able to infiltrate you without really taking high levels of precaution and and you know as i've always said you know the more secure you are the less convenient it is to access your devices so when when we really talk about the difference between different operating systems and how secure or insecure they are are it really comes down to a whole series of a chain of different things for example your processor has its own level of security and that's bound uh, to the hardware that you know it's sitting on and those could have other low level security uh, vulnerabilities uh, all the way up to your operating system the software that runs on it and then its connection to the internet so from my perspective there is no more or less secure operating system because every person's uh, combination of software and hardware is unique which creates its own levels of, uh, you know, either, um, you know, vulnerabilities or lack of vulnerabilities because of what they have. So, for example, if I have 50 pieces of software on my MacBook Air and uh, another 50 pieces of software on my MacBook Pro and only 10 pieces of software on my Windows uh, 10 machine, uh, which one is more or less vulnerable, right? And all it takes is one of those pieces of software to have a vulnerability in it for it to be fully exposed potentially to a hacker or cyber crime criminal. So we, we come across that problem very frequently in having to kind of dispel that myth. 
Uh, what I would say though, is that if you are using a uh, MacBook or otherwise, uh, keeping your system up to date, just like keeping your Mac Windows machines up to date is probably the primary goal, is, is the primary way in which you can hopefully keep most of the 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 hacking away from you know sort of um, uh, the hacking boundary you know putting up that again talking about the moat uh, you know pulling up the drawbridge so to speak is uh, making sure that you patch the holes in the in the castle wall and you pull up the drawbridge and a lot of that is just updating your your system now that's not going to fix everything you know, we were talking before recording that uh, you know we've had some issues with uh, that being the case uh, I think you were you were talking uh, about uh, what was it apple uh recently having uh concern about that you want to let people know let uh sure. listeners viewers know sure it was just a, a a news release in the last um week that that apparently um there there has been an app uh a vulnerability on the um apple um operating system for ios for mobile phones and it's been in the, the vulnerability has been then been there for, for several years um and it was actually discovered by a, um, a team called Project Zero, which is uh, sponsored by, by Google, but they're an independent bunch of guys that just look for vulnerabilities across all devices and, and obviously have a quite a degree of success in, in finding them. But, you know, to your, to your point, um, you know, I think, I think they advised Apple about this vulnerability back in, in February 2019, and, and Apple fixed it within about a week. You know, the, the challenge is, knowing that the vulnerability exists and then you can actually do something about it but sometimes if you don't know these vulnerabilities exist they can be exploited as this one was for, for quite a few years so you know to your point um keeping that operating system up to date with whoever has written the code for it um you know implementing their security patches is, is, a, is a really key uh key key factor in keeping your devices secure but it's not it's it's not bulletproof, and, and even on the Windows side, I, I know um, earlier this year a, a security patch or a patch was released, um, and the patch itself had some vulnerabilities, and, and Microsoft had to recall the patch. So um, it's it's you're much better off keeping your operating system up to up to date. But given the inevitable nature of of trying to keep these um, operating systems secure and the the continuous nature of the attacks that they're under, you know, there's probably some other things that we should be considering as well. So, do you want to just shed some light on those, Ray? Sure. So, so I I like to to break this in half, thinking thinking about it. When you're inside of a trusted network, that is, with you're within the walls of your uh, home or home office network, and uh, and and then or your office network, and then when you're outside of that. So, we talked in the last episode about all the things you can deal with in terms of endpoint, how you can deal with really keeping the castle walls, the drawbridge and the moat in place. Uh, now we step inside of the castle walls and now we're inside of, the, inside of the, the safe protected space. So I wanna talk a little bit about that in this episode and then we can flip to the other side and talk about the, when you leave the castle, you need to put the drawbridge down and you start you know, you start trucking out into the uh, into the forest and to other neighboring villages. We need to be aware that uh, your devices, when they're out there in the wild, uh, there is a greater level of vulnerability there. So inside of the inside of the network, we really have to consider a couple of different things. One is access from device to device, and this comes down to a number of different things. But so many times I see um, Internet of Things devices ha that have access to other computers' data without necessity. So just generally think about limiting which devices have access to other devices. Just, just generally, why, why should your light bulb have access to your computer? And there's really no reason for that to be communicating with one another or even transiting on the same uh, network. You can actually create separate segments of your network so that your IoT devices have access to the internet uh, without having access to the data on your computers. And so you should certainly do that uh, on your office systems, but you can also do this kind of work with just an upgraded uh, router, uh, you know, uh, on in your home uh, networks, which then elevates the level of security you have uh, for yourselves. Uh, then we talk about the idea of admin servers. So many uh, small businesses have servers, <laughs> and those servers 
um, give full access. All the data ports, all the data on those servers are given to everybody else within the, in, within the office because it's presumed that everybody needs access to it. But in reality, only give access to the databases and the data ports that are necessary for the, for the operations of the business. Otherwise, shut them all off for client devices. There's no reason why everybody needs access to everything. So become granular with who gets access to what, and that way, if something really does happen, you have a, at least a little bit of time uh, between the infection or malware or whatever the cyber criminal is trying to do and them getting access to other types of databases or other kinds of data or access and control over other hardware within the, within the entity. So I really, I really believe in access limitations and the, what we call the, the practice of least privilege that is, give the least amount of privileges to all the devices in the system that will allow you to be able to do the job. So not everybody needs administrative access. Uh, not everybody even needs full read-write access uh, to all databases. Maybe some people just need to be able to see the data. Maybe some people need to be able to just add to the data and not delete. Figure out what the rights are for each device and then set the limitations to the least privilege necessary. Um, one other thing that I always talk about is the notion of turning off Wi-Fi. So many times we just default to Wi-Fi nowadays, and the reality is, is that if your computer is just sitting stationary, or your laptop, for example, is a stationary device that leaves the office once a month, once a quarter, never, uh, why is it connected to Wi-Fi? You know, you can, you can hard connect your laptop or computer devices to your network, and now you've reduced a layer of, of vulnerability just by turning off the Wi-Fi card, because now there's one less device that's broadcasting a signal that people can have access to. So I think those are two first beginner points to kind of get yourself moving in the sense that even inside of the walled garden, there's still a level of security that we should be thinking about to, to shut, shut down things. I mean, that includes, I never really followed this practice until a few years ago, but shutting off computers when they're not in use. Uh, you know, it's it seems like a very um, basic thing, uh, but I always like to have all of my devices on, and I recognize that just powering it down, turning it off, is actually really useful, because if it's powered down, it can't be, uh, you know, no one can do anything to it if it's powered off. Uh, so that's a really, really helpful uh, little you know, kind of trick hack uh, for security. Turn it off. <laughs> Good. And, and uh, you know, <clears throat> a couple of comments about that too, uh, Ray. I, I've got a, uh, I, I've, I've eliminated pretty much all social media off my um, Android mobile phone, <clears throat> largely because of the the rights. <clears throat> excuse me. That you give the, uh, the the providers of those applications, those uh, those apps when you when you install them on the phone. Um, and what I've done is I've actually put any social media that I need, so that would be, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, whatever. Um, they're all on a dedicated tablet um, that is always switched off unless I'm using it. And it does not have my any any of my email accounts on it, so it's not actually able to interrogate my contact lists or monitor my phone calls and report back, you know, who I've called and for how long and who I've received calls from and for how long and all the things that apps actually record and monitor and report back to the owner of the app. So I've kind of eliminated that, um, I guess, that, that, that attack surface that, that we, all, we all potentially have. Is your computer driving you crazy? Is it slow or doing things you didn't expect? Well, having a computer crash or pick up a virus can be a complete nightmare for a business. So having someone local you can trust to get you up and running again is critical. The dedicated team of experts at Computer Troubleshooters Toowoomba West will put your mind at ease from the moment you walk through the door and will get your problem solved in no time with a 100% guarantee on their work. Laptops, tablets, PCs, whatever you have, Roger and the team can fix it for you. So visit them today at 236 Bridge Street, Newtown can't get in to see them no worries just call them on 46421331 and they'll come to you Toowoomba Troubleshooters Toowoomba West on the web at www.computertroubleshooters.com.au forward slash Toowoomba West Hutchies lives here we're locals just like you 
To us, construction is really about people, not just bricks and concrete. It's people who bring our structures to life and build communities. We stick by the people who make communities. From Toowoomba Rugby League to RACQ Lifelight Rescue Service, Milne Bay Military Challenge and the Toowoomba Tennis International, Hutchies is proud to back the people who support the region. Oz Hosting is proud to support Switched On IT in bringing practical help to Australian businesses. We're talking to literally hundreds of businesses every day about their IT services, how to make them more efficient, how to make their businesses more efficient and how to protect their valuable data. If you'd like your IT services securely hosted right here in Australia and expertly managed, talk to Oz Hosting. Power TV Australia and Power FM will be broadcasting at Queen's Park in a live simulcast from the Toowoomba Christmas Wonderland on December 20 from 7pm. We'll be chatting to a few of the people that make it happen and find out how it all comes together. So make it a date, December 20th, 7pm at the Toowoomba Christmas Wonderland for the live simulcast between Power TV Australia and Power FM. Another comment I'd, I'd have is, it's interesting, you know, um, having considering for example our wi-fi connectivity i'm actually in an office at the moment um and there's there's um ethernet connections hardwired connections you know through the through the office um but i'm on a macbook pro so that i don't have that rj45 port on the macbook pro so in that scenario i'm kind of committed to um to using the wi-fi so i really take on board your point that you know what I should be doing, and and what I actually do do is is I disconnect the Wi-Fi when I'm not using the the laptop, or I just completely switch it off. And just yeah, remarkably though, just, just so that you know and and viewers know, um, you can actually buy adapters. Apple has adapters mm -hmm. for those that actually goes from right. either USB or you know your Lightning uh, port, and will let you connect to RJ45. Um, you know, through it and actually have them for my laptops for that very reason. <laughs> I like yeah. to hardline um, connect when I can. Exactly. And I've been meaning to get one of those because I've got, you know, um, it, it allows me to actually then do, do um, management on the, on the router and the switch that I'd like to do to make that a little bit more secure. At the moment, I've got an old MacBook Pro as well, which is, does have the RJ45 port, but um, yeah, I'm definitely going to get one of those adapters so that I've got, you know, the device I'm on right now able to to connect to the uh, to the switch and um, and manage the security settings of that, and make sure that it's up to date. Um, just one other aspect that I thought I'd I'd point out with with regard to, you know, a Windows device, as you know, Oz Hosting is is um, provides a, a huge number of businesses with their Office three six five licenses and. Um, Typically, our, our customers are small businesses and they're just buying the, you know, the basic email service. Um, that often means that they've got a rich variety of, of operating systems. They're running Windows 7, Windows 8. Um, you, you know, it could be a, a number of different things. It's actually now a lot less expensive um, for, a, for a small business to buy a bundled plan off Microsoft, which will include Windows 10 and also some advanced threat protection on their email. So one of the biggest dangers we see with, with our, our customers is that their device is not all that secure. And because the device is not all that secure, it means that their um, business email is not all that secure. And when bad actors get into their email and are able to read all their emails, see what the business's standard invoice look, looks like, They've got all the information on who the customer base is because they may have camped on the system for, you know, six or 12 months. And then at some point, they're able to uh, send a, an excellent um, facsimile of a company's invoice, you know, perfect in terms of who it's to, the amount that it's charging, um, everything in every way is, is sent out. And of course, um, particularly if they've got access to, you know, to their, to their email service, and we saw one of these in the last seven or eight weeks, they're able, they're able to then hard delete all the emails from the sent folder and then the business doesn't know which of their customers has received a fake invoice. And we had one recently where, where one of the customers 
pay the fake invoice. It was a construction company, so a large invoice, $95,000 uh, Australian. And, and of course, it's going to be tough to, to go back and, and um, uh, say to that company that paid, paid the invoice to the wrong bank account that they haven't extinguished $95,000 worth of debt because the company is just going to say, hey, the email came off your email service to us. It was perfect in every way. So, you know, the, the problem is yours. You know, you wonder where these things are, are going to end up. So there is a product uh, in the Microsoft plans called Microsoft 365 Business, and that includes uh, Windows 10, which is then easy to keep up to date. That's got the Defender, um, you know, antivirus and device protection capability on it. It's also got advanced threat protection for your email system, so it'll identify malware, um, uh, bad links, bad links that, that, that are good links at the moment and become subsequently bad links that will even continue to monitor a link that is sent um, the person in an email. And as soon as it becomes toxic, uh, the Microsoft mail service will, will disable your ability to click on that link when you open it in Outlook or uh, on a browser interface. So, you know, there's, there's some smart things that people can do in that space. And typically our, our observation would be that a lot of businesses, if they bought their email service, their antivirus, um, their operating system, and the advanced threat protection capabilities, if they bought them all separately, they would pay a lot more than the bundle price that, that Microsoft have, have put in place. Um, and so that's, you know, I think that's quite a new thing. And I think it'll take, it'll probably take a little time for, for businesses to get to get comfortable with that. But, um, you know, we can see that once you actually start to, to manage the, uh, the, the attack surface with those tools, you can get, you can get a lot more sophisticated in terms of what you're able to um, prevent happening in the business. And, uh, and just to sort of continue on with that, there is, there is some capabilities in, in that particular plan where you're then able to, to set some policies such as uh, disable automatic forwarding of emails from the user to an external email address. Now, we saw recently one of our, one of our clients, um, architectural firm, they had had automatic forwarding set up at, at an admin level um, on the principal's email account, forward into a Gmail account somewhere in the world for two years. And you can imagine all the plans, credit card information, bank details that would have gone in and out of that mailbox over two years is extraordinary. So with those, with those sort of higher grade tools, you're able to actually set some policy settings and say, hey, you know, we're going to disable the ability of people to forward emails to an external um, individual. Or if we're going to allow it, we're going to create an alert and that will, that will alert the security admin for the, for the business saying, hey, this particular user is, is set up forwarding and it's going to this hotmail address or this Gmail address or whatever it might be. And, and people can then make a, an informed decision on whether or not that, that has got some, some merit. Um, but yeah. interestingly, the, the, the basic plans that are offered by Microsoft, and I think most email providers, don't give you those, uh, those rights or privileges. You've got to sort of go up the tree a little bit and then start to, to think about, well, what are the sorts of policy settings we want? Another one is, is you know, for example, retrieving um, uh, files from, from your file sharing system and forwarding them to another party. That's another one which is exploited by, you know, by the bad folks. Um, to you know, to take control of the business or to to uh, you know exploit and, and derive some sort of gain. So you know there there are these things which are kind of um, I guess they're in in a sense it's it's your cloud application, but you access it through the device. And if you actually use some of the settings, then then obviously um, your device is is not being used to uh, you know to further the exploits of a bad actor. Yeah, you bring up you bring up a really important point that kind of dovetails into one of my other suggestions, which is built into Office 365. I'm I'm not sure which plan it kicks in, uh, but you get a free subscription to the Microsoft's Azure Active Directory, which then gives you uh, greater control over single sign-on, uh, SAML, and other kinds of of multi-factor authentication, um, where you have that kind of uh, administrative control over the the users. Because remember, all it takes is one employee's lack of you know lack of security or vulnerability to create an internal 
kind of that entry into uh, the rest of your system. They can easily backdoor into it. So with uh, Azure Active Directory, similar to Microsoft Active Directory, it gives you that kind of control where your your users now log into Microsoft Dynamics CRM, they log into Microsoft Office uh, to Word and other tools all through the same login. And that means you have a greater trust over that single point of entry, which has Microsoft's backing through Office 365 to enter, as opposed to many different logins to many different systems that could potentially increase the number of usernames and passwords that can be hacked. And uh, so, I always recommend to everybody, if your system allows for it, you know, the software and services that you use, if it allows for what's called two-factor or multi-factor authentication, activate those on everything that's possible. Uh, we did an episode prior to this where we talked about uh, two-factor and multi-factor authentication, so head back to the archives and look, look that up, uh, but I highly recommend that. And if you're running a business, Microsoft, uh, Google, uh, and Apple all allow for different versions of single sign-on. Uh, there are ways in which you can use single sign-on to reduce the number of usernames and logins and giving you greater trust because you know that Microsoft and Google are doing a much better job at security than your employees are. So they're gonna be able to structure <laughs> your uh, your sign-on uh, you know, requirements, uh, long passwords, using multi-factor authentication, and all of those other things through rules that you can promulgate down, and that means that your systems are more secure. So you're right on, Doug, about making sure that we use the, the technology in the cloud that can enforce device-level security that otherwise we won't do. You know, if we're, not, if we're not forced to have that security, we won't. Um, one quick myth before we move on to being outside of the network that I want to debunk is this idea of changing passwords. Uh, we have all of these weird um, systems where it requires you to change passwords every <clears throat> X often. Uh, people are not already changing their passwords to secure passwords, so stop making people change passwords to less secure ones because they have to constantly change them. Turn off all of this device password change after 60 or 90 days nonsense, okay? You're making us all less secure by having to change passwords all the time. <laughs> because what happens, right? You know, I, I change my password to 123, then it tells me to change my password again, I change it to password 1234, uh, and it just becomes this perpetuating cycle of very insecure passwords because people want it to be more convenient. And um, and it shows no level of, of data, to, no level of data shows us that uh, changing your password often actually makes your system more secure. Uh, it ultimately means that all of, as long as all of your passwords are different from service to service, then that increases your security, right? Because if somebody captures my email address and password for uh, my email, uh, they won't have my email and password or my username or account number and password to my bank account because they're different. That increases my security. But changing the password of the same service is just increasing more work and not actually creating more security for me. So stop all of those things, uh, except if you're in enterprise IT and you know what you're doing, and that's why you're changing passwords every so often, uh, then, then stop. I mean, you know, the more important ones are multi-factor with OTP, which is one-time password generation. That's the type of security that I'd, I'd love to see every system adopt, so that I get a little, you know, I open up my phone, I get a little number that is generated that allows me to be able to securely log in username, password, ask me for a one-time code. I put that one-time code in, and now only I can access the device and services that are, you know, that can verify it's me. So that's the kind of security I'm looking for, not this nonsense of constantly changing passwords so that <laughs> you're just having to do more work. So with that myth dispelled, uh, let's talk about security outside of the network. So we put down the drawbridge and you go out into uh, the outer lying forest and villages. What can we do to be more secure out there? What suggestions do you have, Doug, for folks? Sure. Um, well, uh, I've certainly encountered some situations with our customers where they've been um, out, in the, out in the villages, out in the far reaches from their office network. Um, and, and we've seen some, unfortunately, some pretty pretty rough things happening to them. Um, you know, one of them was a immigration law firm and I think they were on free airport Wi-Fi. Um, and of course there was the urgent um, 
Friday requests for bank transfers going to the accounts team from the practice managers um, PC and and these guys obviously have been in there for long enough to to know that um, the owner of the business was traveling um, and uh, therefore the, the practice manager was sort of deputized to authorize bank transfers their device had been compromised and they were sending very urgent and quite aggressive messages to the accounts team to orchestrate bank transfers um, how how do they protect themselves against that right that was a bit of a rough one. Well, there's a number of different things that we can we can say. This one's more human centered, uh, but the first human centered approach is to whenever anyone asks for anything major to be done, and you can decide what that major thing is. Uh, you know, it can be a dollar amount, uh, it can be a particular type of of authority that's necessary. That we then do just like multi-factor authentication, we use multi-factor confirmation. That is use a means where you get a real live human on the phone and you say hey bill you know did you ask me to move a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> and just that simple call uh, or synchronous communication it will allow you to be able to identify whether or not something has been uh, corrupted right in that mis in that communication chain and uh, we have that in my company. Nobody is allowed to do certain types of authorizations on movements of clients' data, clients' uh, authorizations to move domains or those kinds of things without actually getting a client on the phone and saying, hey, do you really want this to happen? Because so often, you know, you get a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, you know, foreign mal actors who are trying to just get a client uh, to send uh, a, an authorization over to you uh, to transfer domains so they can then hold that domain ransom and uh, and then, you know, sell it, basically sell it back to the client. And so um, we never wanted that to happen. Uh, so we make sure that we have an actual live phone call. It happens twice, right? There's a phone call to the client and there's a phone call to me. And then, and then I can confirm to them, hey, this, we've talked talk to two live human beings and given authorization and confirmation of that of that transfer, and that just means that you know these these simple automation type things just don't happen uh, without without human intervention. And yes, it slows things down ever so uh, ever so slightly, uh, but what it does is it creates a sense of security that my clients know they have in working with me, and and I just I appreciate that they are understanding of that. And those that are not understanding of that, I just don't want to work with them because they're the ones who are getting hacked and spending more money and having the problems. They cause way more problems downstream for us than, than the clients who actually do the right things. So we really pay attention to that. So that's one, one thing. Um, one of the other really important things that I always think about is that you um, make sure that you think that as soon as you leave the, the um, the the walls of your castle and you cross over that that bridge you are now in a hostile environment you are you are in hostile territory and so the the number one thing i always tell everybody is when you are when you are on public wi-fi and that includes not just your uh not just you're at a cafe this means any other internet connection that you're connected to, any network that you're connected to that is not yours, that you're not controlling. That means if you go to a client site, if you go, you know, client's office or home, you know, maybe you're a realtor and you go into their home and you're doing a, a, a presentation on how you're going to sell their home, uh, you're now on a hostile network. Not hostile because the people are, which maybe they could be, but <laughs> generally it's not them trying to harm you. It's actually the fact that they're on a network that you don't control. So you don't know what kind of security they've put in place. And if you don't know what security has been put in place, presume the worst, right? Presume that somebody is, is actively trying to uh, gain access to that network and is actively trying to uh, take data from you. And maybe they're not, maybe they are, it doesn't matter. It's better to be safe than sorry here. So I always say, make sure that you act as though you're in a hostile public network at all times, even when you're connected to somebody else's network. Uh, that also means that you limit the sites while you're on other networks. So frequently I, I get clients, you know, I have an executive client here and there who travel quite extensively. Um, as I do, I travel quite extensively for work. And as we travel around, I have to constantly remind everybody, if you don't need to log into your bank when you're 
at the airport on airport Wi-Fi? Don't. Uh, <laughs> I know this seems uh, remarkably simple, but don't try to access uh, highly secure pieces of data infrastructure for yourself. Uh, don't don't use your connection to your bank account. Don't connect to your uh, social security, uh, you know, the, the social security administration or whatever, um, you know, uh, government access sites that you're you're on when you're on public networks. Do not do it. Um, you know, sometimes you have to because there's an emergency, but generally you can wait until you're back in the safety of your own network to be able to do those things. Um, and also just a little bit of education that you're you're making sure that that little lock icon appears on the site but don't just don't just look at the lock icon if you look at your browser and then you look at what's called the second level domain so when we talk about top level domain that's your .com .net .gov that's the that's the point that you know happens after the dot the word or words before the dot are what we call the second level domain. So in www.example.com, example is the second level domain. So everything before that becomes subdomain. So the www is the subdomain, right? That's the, that's the subdomain of your second level domain, example, in the example.com. We wanna make sure that where you're going to, the example part is right. Because what hackers do is that they will send you to places and it'll say uh, Google dot four, five, six, seven, two, nine, dot com, right? And so what it what it appears to be is that Google, you're going to Google, right? Because it says Google dot. But in reality, you're going to whatever I just said, the number letter combination, dot com. So we want to be very, very clear that, that if you're going to Google dot com, you're going to Google dot com. And that's the part that ends it. The second level domain and the dot com are correct in that URL and that you're using encryption that is TLS encryption, that little lock icon will appear so that your data is being transited securely. So just a little few things to keep in mind there as you leave the networks that you know and trust to the networks that are out there in the world, make sure that you're going ahead and just following some, some basic cybersecurity hygiene that keeps you clean from getting infected. Um, I guess I'll, I'll close with this one though, and this is really important. Do not plug into anything. Um, you know, I, I know that this seems so, uh, you know, uh, um, enticing for most people. Uh, their mobile phone is running out of, of, of power and you're at the cafe and uh, someone hands you their power adapter and says, oh, here, you can borrow my power adapter. Don't do it. <laughs> Let your phone die. Um, you know, you can run out of battery and be without your phone for a couple of hours. I'm sorry. I know that it feels like you cannot, uh, but go back and get power some other way, or um, use a condom. Uh, <laughs> and by that mean, I mean a USB condom. Um, so a USB condom is a little tiny adapter. And that little tiny adapter, what it does is it gives you access to the power side of USB, but not the data transfer side of USB. Okay, so it actually disconnects those two pieces in the USB uh, port, so it cannot transit data. When, when, uh, when, when I, some stranger off the street, hands you an adapter and cord, you have no idea what that person has done or modified to that adapter that could be taking data, siphoning data off of your, off of your device uh, when you plug into it. With a USB condom, you're capable of putting a barrier between the cord and cable and your device. And if you cannot do that, then do not plug into it. Uh, the only thing that you might find safe is if you plug a power outlet, you know, three prong or a double prong, uh, you know, pl uh, plug into a uh, power source uh, and then, you know, connect your laptop to it. Uh, you can be fairly safe and uh, that there's no data transferring between the power and your, your laptop, uh, you know, in that regard. Uh, but otherwise, do not be plugging into, uh, you know, hostile, you know, uh, environments uh, <laughs> with, with your mobile devices. It, I see it all the time now. It's about once a week I see uh, something in the security uh, you know, articles that I read about someone who has been hacked because they plugged into one of those towers. You'll see those towers sitting in public spaces where you can plug your uh, phone in and get a charge. They have these public charging stations and these kinds of, of places that have cords or cables that they're just giving to you and you can plug in over the counter at, at your neighborhood bar. Uh, you can plug in, you know, at the cafe. Those are all ripe for someone to be able to steal your data. Don't be silly. Do not plug in. You can you can either survive without your phone, 
or bring a battery backup. Those little battery backups, they're really thin nowadays. I have one that's about double the size of a credit card, and it has the ability to give me at least four or five hours of, of battery charge in addition to my regular battery. Carry one of those with a small cable, and you can go ahead and plug into it. It's worth carrying that over not having carried it and then plugging into somebody and them siphoning uh, all kinds of personal uh, financial and personal and or your client data off of your mobile devices. Yeah, totally agree. Is your computer driving you crazy? Is it slow or doing things you didn't expect? Well, having a computer crash or pick up a virus can be a complete nightmare for a business. So having someone local you can trust to get you up and running again is critical. The dedicated team of experts at Computer Troubleshooters Toowoomba West will put your mind at ease from the moment you walk through the door and will get your problem solved in no time with a 100% guarantee on their work. Laptops, tablets, PCs, whatever you have, Roger and the team can fix it for you. So visit them today at 236 Bridge Street, Newtown can't get in to see them no worries just call them on 46 42 1331 and they'll come to you Toowoomba Troubleshooters Toowoomba West on the web at www.computertroubleshooters.com.au forward slash Toowoomba West Hutchies lives here we're locals just like you to us construction is really about people not just bricks and concrete it's people who bring our structures to life and build communities. We stick by the people who make communities. From Toowoomba Rugby League to RACQ Lifelight Rescue Service, Milton Bay Military Challenge and the Toowoomba Tennis International, Hutchies is proud to back the people who support the region. Oz Hosting is proud to support Switched On IT in bringing practical help to Australian businesses. We're talking to literally hundreds of businesses every day about their IT services, how to make them more efficient, how to make their businesses more efficient and how to protect their valuable data. If you'd like your IT services securely hosted right here in Australia and expertly managed, talk to Oz Hosting. Power TV Australia and Power FM will be broadcasting at Queen's Park in a live simulcast from the Toowoomba Christmas Wonderland on December 20 from 7pm. We'll be chatting to a few of the people that make it happen and find out how it all comes together. So make it a date, December 20th, 7pm at the Toowoomba Christmas Wonderland for the live simulcast between Power TV Australia and Power FM. Um, a, a couple of other things there too, and that is uh, when, you're, when you're outside the castle and you're carting your, your device around, um, you know, you've got your, your little laptop, at, whether it's a Windows or, or a MacBook Pro or something like that. Um, toggle off your phone. Use your 4G, 5G mobile phone connection. You don't have to use everybody's, uh, you know, so-called free and apparently secure, but as we all know, most likely unsecure, um, Wi-Fi or even their, you know, even the, even the hotel networks or different networks that you can you can plug into. If you've got your mobile phone and you've got a reasonable data plan, uh, it's much more prudent to, to use that to plug into a known device on a, um, you know, at least you, you, you know what you're getting when you're getting your telco network. The level of security is going to be better than a, than a Wi-Fi link. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I had, a, I had, a, <laughs> I had a, um, a conference that I attended and there was a security presenter and what he did the night before was he sat on the network and was picking up all of the conferees uh, unsecure data. And then uh, well, what he did really interestingly, what he did was he named, he created a new network with his laptop and it looked like the hotel's name, right? So just uh -huh. he just created a network on his laptop, which is very easy to do. And anybody who connected to that network, uh, un unbeknownst to them, he was uh, logging data off of off of those people's computers. And then when he came to do his security presentation, he then started calling people out in the audience saying, hey, are you so-and-so? Hey, are you so-and-so? You connected to my network last night, not to the hotel's network. And I was siphoning data off of your systems. And so, uh, you know, it just goes to show how imperative it is to be very conscientious about everything you connect to and every site you go to when you are outside of your own 
out, out of your own, you know, kind of walled garden. Uh, and um, I will I will also note that if you travel by air, like I do frequently, uh, it is very likely that whether it be the US, Australian, or any other uh, federal government, um, they are scanning the devices as you make your way through those airports. Their, their national security is are scanning the, the hard drives of the devices. They don't need to be on for them to be able to scan some of these technologies. Uh, so just be aware that if you have something that is of great security to you and you do not want other either foreign or domestic governments uh, scanning that, that and capturing that data, do not bring it with you. Just don't bring it. it it's as simple as that. Uh, there are all kinds of ways in which you can just bring uh, you know, your, your uh, tablet that is wiped clean of everything and is just kind of for travel. It can connect to your services through the web browser. And that way, all of your local stores are empty other than the temporary stores to access things within the browser. And you're not carrying, you know, business and client data and all kinds of other data with you. Uh, you know, if you, if you are capable of it, turn off any and get rid of any data on your phones that happen to be connected while you're on travel, you can always put it back after you get back, but the, or even put it back, put it on while you're overseas and then take it off while you go through those airports. But um, I have to say, the, the more and more I read about it, the less and less I am uh, confident in, you know, transiting any uh, security in airports and being comfortable with the level at which they are now, um, for what they say is national security reasons, uh, but I don't know what their actual reasoning is for doing all of this uh, surveilling, but they are doing this work. Uh, it's been it's been fairly well documented now, and so I just don't trust. Uh, you know, it's it's not about trusting your own government or foreign governments. Don't trust any of them with your data, especially your business and client data. You know, I don't particularly care what your thoughts are in terms of your own personal data, but it's really your clients and, um, have not consented to having their data given to foreign governments, for example, um, unless you purposefully have gotten that kind of, of uh, you know, permission, you haven't given that, to, that they haven't given that permission uh, to you. So just don't do it. Absolutely. Well, um, Barry, we've probably brought ourselves up to, uh, to, to sign off time. Have you got any uh, questions or, or points to add for, for today's discussion? No, I don't think so. I think that um, uh, that's been a very thorough discussion that we've had and um, uh, dispelled some of the myths. Uh, I think that probably uh, lots of us, uh, I'm, uh, when you were talking about uh, charging your phone at public places, uh, I'd never even thought actually about the fact that uh, uh, people in those public charging places could be stealing my data. So uh, I think that that's possibly a wake-up call for uh, for lots of people because we see a lot of those places now. But uh, I think that that's been a very interesting and useful discussion. Um, and uh, we will uh, leave it there. Thank you, Doug Endersby and Ray Sidney Smith. Um, we will look forward to seeing you again next week. Good night. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Barry. Well, there you have it. That's been another really interesting discussion. Um, I think that there are probably things in there that may raise questions for you. Uh, if it does, if there's anything that you would like to ask either of our experts, um, be sure to email us or get onto the Power TV website and use our contact page to send us a message. Um, anything that you want to ask us, uh, we will then send back to Ray and Doug and get them to answer your questions for you. This has been Switched on IT. I'm Barry. Take care.